In this video, we'll go through how to boot an AMD Xilinx Zinc system on chip from an SD card. We'll go through partitioning and formatting the SD card, which images and files to copy over to the SD card after, for example, the Petal Linux build process and some things to pay attention to, for example, boot modes and so on. I'll also show you an interesting workaround for a first stage bootloader in case you would like to boot off EMMC memory or if you've not connected your SD card to the standard boot mode SD pins on the Zinc 7000 series. For this, we'll be using this custom PCB I designed, which is a mixed signal audio analyzer. So one side is digital with the AMD Zinc 7000 series, gigabit ethernet, DDR3 memory, and so on. And the other side is a fully isolated analog audio interface with ADCs, DACs, and analog front ends. In the end, we'll see then how to boot Petal Linux and see this is a much faster boot process than, for example, JTAG boot and so on. A huge thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. I had these ASCO PCBs we saw at the start of this video manufactured and assembled by PCBWay in China, and they did a great job. I typically use the advanced PCB design service where I get full customization of my PCB design. I can go from a single unit in quantity, that's either without assembly or with assembly, up to 60 layers, even HDI boards with buried blind micro -vias and so on, and very, very many customization options, including impedance control, custom stack up, and so on. Of course, they provide an assembly service as well, which I typically use for my PCB designs, so I'd strongly suggest checking them out, and I'll leave a link to them in the description box below. As usual, also a huge thank you to Altium for sponsoring this video. I used Altium Designer to design the hardware for this video, this ASCO PCB. And if you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to go to altium.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's Lab, and you can get an Altium Designer free trial with Altium 365, as well as 25% off your first license purchase. With your free trial of Altium Designer, make sure also to check out Altium 365, which includes cool features such as library management, mechanical code design, design reviews, and much, much more. Lastly, to help you with your component search, rather than going to individual distributors, make sure to check out Octopart at octopart.com. I'll actually be making a couple of videos for the Octopart YouTube channel, so make sure that you're subscribed to them as well. Links in the description box below as usual. If you haven't already, make sure to check out video number 96 up to video number 100 on my channel, which goes through a full FPGA system on chip AMD Xilinx Zinc 7000 series bring up tutorial for a custom PCB, going through the whole flashing process, going through setting up DDR3 memory, QSO memory, and setting up Petalinux as well in the last part of that series of videos. And I'll take this as a prerequisite for this video where we'll be seeing how to set up hardware wise and then also boot via Peta Linux from an SD card using our Zinc 7000 series IC. So please make sure to check out those videos as the information in there will be required for this video. A very useful document for bringing up and for when you're designing your own Zinc 7000 PCBs and hardware is the AMD User Guide UG585. In the boot and configuration section, we can see there are many different ways of booting other Zinc 7000, if that's for bare metal applications, or in our case today, we'll be looking at Peta Linux. Typical boot sources for the Zinc 7000 series are NAND flash, NOR flash, SD card, QSPY, and JTAG. In previous videos, we looked at QSPY and JTAG, and today we'll be looking at an SD card. Because there are some special requirements when booting from an SD card, we have certain pin requirements, certain logic level requirements, and so on. If we jump to the SD card boot section, we can see we can boot from standard SD or SDHC cards, we need a specific type of file system for the boot section, and I'll show you how to set that up on the SD card later on. And we can use SD cards up to 32 gigabytes in density, although I have managed to do this with larger SD card densities. The actual boot mode, if we boot from, for example, SD card, or if we do JTAG boot, NAND, or QSPI flash, as we'll see in a schematic in just a second, is controlled by strapping pins, and these strapping pins are sampled by the boot from at startup, and that's how we select the boot mode, and when we'll go through that in this video. It turns out, using these strapping pins and these boot mode options, if we go down to the SD card boot MIO register settings, we can see the SD card interface is fixed to certain MIO pins, which are pins connected to the processing system of the Zinc 7000 series. So we have the clock on MIO40, command on MIO41, and the data between 42 and 45 of the MIO. So these are fixed pins if you would like to use the strapping options and the boot mode select options for your Zinc. In my case, I actually didn't use these pins, and there's a workaround to get the Zinc to boot from different pins, which I'd like to show you as well in this video, which I think can be quite useful in certain cases. 
If you're interested generally in how to design for Zinc 7000 series PCBs, make sure to check out UG933, which goes to the whole PCB design guidelines, also boot mode pins and more. And if you'd like to go into far more detail how to do everything regarding designing around Zincs and FPGAs, make sure to check out my advanced digital hardware design course, and I'll leave a link to that in the description box below. In any case, jumping over to Altum Designer, where I had designed this ASCO PCB, which we saw at the beginning of this video and what we'll be using for this video to boot from an SD card, we have our Zinc 7000 series IC on the left hand side here, which interfaces with some DDR3 memory. We have QSPY flash just above that, EMC memory, and various peripherals such as Gigabit Ethernet, USB 2.0 high speed, and I also have another USB connection which connects an FTDI programmer. So this is effectively a USB to JTAG and USB to UART converter. And this is how we're gonna do all of our debugging, flashing and so forth. I'm powering this device either via this one programmer USB connection or via USB-C power delivery or PD. We won't be going into detail, but on the bottom side, I have this fully isolated analog section, which is effectively an audio oscilloscope and audio arbitrary wave gen. What we have also connected is to the Zinc 7000 series, if you look on the bottom side, which we already saw at the beginning of this video, is a micro SD card connector. This micro SD card connector connects via a logic level translator or level shifter to the Zinc 7000 series. And we'll see later on why we actually need this logic level shifter. Also on the left hand side, we can see we have this mode switch and this mode switch actually toggles the boot mode strapping pins for the Zinc 7000 series. So depending on how we set these micro dip switches, we can either boot from JTAG, QSPY, SD card, and so forth. Briefly jumping over to the schematic, just to familiarize ourselves with what connections are required, and then later on moving to Peta Linux, I find it important that we know what we're dealing with hardware-wise, and that could also help you when you want to implement SD cards connected to the Zinc 7000 series. Please keep in mind, we are rushing through this. I have a few videos on creating hardware for the Zinc 7000 series, which I'll leave in the description box below. For the processing system, for the MIO interface pins, the IO pins, we have two banks for this specific IC. We have bank zero and we have bank one. Bank zero is connected to 3.3 volts and bank one is connected to 1.8 volts. The reason for connecting bank one to 1.8 volts is that I have various high speed peripherals, for example, the gigabit ethernet PHY or the USB 2.0 high speed PHY. And for those interfaces such as ULPI or RGMII, I need to have a 1.8 volt logic standard. That's why MIO1 runs off 1.8 volts because all of those high speed peripherals are connected to bank one of my zinc. This will become important because we also have to connect our SD card to that bank. Now looking at the MIO pins, so this is the processing system IO pins, we can see we have our QSPY connections, which also double as these boot mode strapping options. And here we have our micro dip switch, which is this switch three. Now, depending on if those are logic low or logic high at boot, the boot ROM will identify various different boot modes and strapping options. For example, if boot mode 0, 1, and 2 are all zeros, we have JTAG boot, whereas if boot mode 0 is 1, boot mode 1 is 0, and boot mode 2 is 1, we have SD card boot, which is what we'll be using later on, but we can also use QSBI boot, which is a different strapping option, so on. That's why I made this flexible via this boot mode dip switch. And all of this again are in these user guides and the reference manuals, which I'll link in the description box below as well. In any case, other than all of my other high speed interfaces in bank one of the MIOs, I also have my SD card connections, which happen to be on SD zero. It turns out that the SD card has to be connected to SD zero and not SD one. And specifically, if you want to just use the basic strapping pins, they have to be connected to MIO40 to MIO45 with the signals as we see from user guide 585. In my case, for various reasons, I actually don't have that connected to these, and therefore I have to do a little workaround in software, which I'll show you later, but I'd suggest connecting SD0 to MIO40 to MIO45 as suggested in the user guide U585, so you can very quickly use these boot mode strapping options. In any case, because we have to use SD0 and because SD0 lives in bank one and bank one also uses, for example, gigabit ethernet or USB high speed in this particular case, this means bank one of the processing system has to run off 1.8 volts. Now, typically SD cards will run off 3.3 volts and that's why we have to have this logic level shifter in line between the zinc and between the SD card for bi-directional communication between the 1.8 volt interface and the 3.3 volt interface. That's the reason why we have this level shifter here. Other than that, the connections are pretty much point to point. If you've seen my Zinc bring up videos, again, links in the description box below, you're probably familiar with the Vivado process of creating the relevant hardware design files. I have a project for this ASCO PCB, and again, for this, 
I have a block design, which very simply just contains the Zinc 7 processing system. Again, if you're unfamiliar, please check out the Bring Up series and that'll go through this in detail. I'm rushing through this a bit in this video. But double click on this, I can open up the Zinc 7000 series processing system configuration. And what we did in previous videos was, for example, set the bank voltages. Again, bank zero is at 3.3 volts, bank one is at 1.8 volts. And this is where I have my configuration of my various interfaces. And this is what you have to set up if you want to, for example, code in bare metal, or if you want to bring up, bring up Peta Linux, this is where you would set up your interfaces. For us, we'll need QSPY flash, which is mapped to these pins in bank zero at 3.3 volts. We might want to use ethernet, and of course our SD interfaces. Remember, SD card should be on, on SD0, which can be in various positions, but it always is in bank one. And in bank one, if we're using, for example, ethernet or USB high speed, this will have to be at a logic level of 1.8 volts. And again, this is why we needed that level shifter to interface with our 3.3 volt SD card. So I have ethernet selected and I have USB. So typically you would select SD0, which are pins 40 to 45, according to the technical reference manual. So I'd suggest going with SD0 unless you have other reasons. I happen to have gone with SD0 exactly for other reasons. So my pins are actually mapped to pins 28 to 33. And that requires some additional tricks, which we'll see later on to get this to boot if we use different SD0 pins, but that be an interesting use case. Other than that, of course, you should set up your DDR3 configuration, which I've done here. And again, please see the previous videos on how to do that and the rest of the hardware configuration as before. Then from this hardware configuration, if we just want to do a very, very basic bring up, boot up Peta Linux to see if all of our peripherals are working so on, all we would do is, for example, generate Bitstream, which will run the synthesis and run the implementation. Once you've done that, again, I'm rushing through this. I'll say this for the last time. Please watch the previous videos on how to do this in detail. Then I'll do file, export, export hardware, and I'll follow this process, including the Bitstream, which will then export one of these .xsa files, which contains our hardware configuration. So we'll need that, we'll need to export this XSA file and we'll work from that for the other processes. If you haven't already, I'd strongly suggest checking out video number 100 on my channel, which goes through the Peta Linux build process, how to set up the AMD Xilinx tools, how to build and configure the Peta Linux kernel, and then how to flash that via JTAG. So this effectively starts from generating the XSA file, as we just saw, downloading the tools required for Peta Linux, then creating a new Peta Linux project, configuring and using the XSA file for the Peta Linux build, configuring the kernel, configuring U-boot, configuring the root file system, and then building Peta Linux. Finally, this video also shows you how to use a JTAG boot mode to flash Peta Linux to the Zinc. And this is a very, very lengthy process, and therefore we'll do it in this video with an SD card, which is far faster and allow us for far quicker prototyping and testing, for example. So please make sure you follow that video because we'll be jumping over some steps for this video. The next step then I would like to show you after you've built your Peta Linux images for your particular system is how to format an SD card for SD boot. We'll be starting with a completely blank and new SD card. I just got this from the shop and we'll format this together and then put on the required images for Peta Linux in this video. What we need to do for an SD card to boot Peta Linux is have two partitions. One is partition zero, which is a fairly small partition which contains the boot images. And this could be one gigabyte, for example, in this example, or smaller. Of course, it needs to be able to fit the various images we will load down later. And this needs to be a fat file system type. The second partition, or in this case, partition one, is a far larger partition. This will use the rest of the SD card space, and this needs to be formatted in this Linux X4 file system type. So I'm actually using Ubuntu in a virtual machine on my Windows desktop machine, and I've plugged in an SD card reader to USB converter, and I selected that in VirtualBox by going to USB, and you can see I've selected the SD card reader, and I've already plugged in my empty SD card. We can see that here. We have a completely new 32 gigabyte SD card plugged into the SD card reader. What we don't want to do first with the empty SD card is create the partitions. And after that, we would like to format these partitions to the relevant file system types. The way we'll do that is run fdisk as a super user and my SD card happens to be mounted to SDC. In fdisk, I can press P to look at my partitions and we see we don't actually have any partitions there, but we can see, for example, sector sizes and the overall SD card size. We would like to make a new partition. This will be our first FAT32 partition. We'll just allocate some space for that and make it bootable. So press N and enter. We would like to make this a primary partition and the partition number, we would like to be that the first, so default is one. Anytime you see default, you can simply press enter. The first sector should start where the first sector starts, which is in this case defaulted 2048, so press enter. And we'd like to make this, for example, 
a gigabyte in size. So I can either calculate what sector that is or simply type in plus one G, enter. And now we've created a new partition of size one gigabyte. But we'd also like to make this first partition, which is our boot partition, we want to make this bootable. The way we make this bootable is type in A and press enter, and now partition one is bootable. Again, we can use the P command to look at the partitions and we can see we have a partition which is bootable at STC one and size one gigabyte. Now let's create the second partition. Again, same process, we type in N, enter. We want to make this a primary partition and partition number two. So press enter to select the default. And we want to make this partition, the root file system partition, occupy the remaining space on this 32 gigabyte SD card. So we'll first we'll create this for the first sector at the end of the first partition. So use the default, press enter. And the last sector will also leave at default, which it then uses the whole SD card space. So press enter. And now we should have two partitions. If we press P again, we have partition one, which is SDC one, which is one gigabyte in size and is bootable. And we have another partition, our second partition at SDC two, which takes up the remaining space of the SD card, but isn't bootable. This is for our root file system. To write this to the disk, we press W and enter. And now we have an SD card partitioned into these two sections. To make them appear effectively to our file system, of course, now we have to format them to certain file system types. The way I'll do that is I'll run as a super user, make file system .vfat, a FAT32 file system, SDC1, this command here, press enter. And we can see in the back end, we have our boot file system now appeared. The same thing we'd like to then do, but for the second partition, and in this case, you want an X4 file system type. And we'd like to call this partition root, and again, X4 file system. So this is the command I'll type in. This will take a bit longer because it's a larger file system, of course, about 30 gigabytes. And here we go. Now in the background, we can see we have boot and root partitions, and this is exactly the structure we would then like. What we then have to do as a second step, as we've created the boot and root partitions, is copy over and extract the relevant files and images to these two partitions. In my Peta Linux tool folders, I've gone through my video, so video number 100, to create the Peta Linux build. So I have ASCO Peta Linux, and for example, if we go to the images folder, Linux, we have various different files. Let's start off with copying over the relevant files to the boot partition. And again, we want the script boot.scr, we want boot.bin and the uboot image. I'll take these and I'll simply copy these over to my boot partition like so. For the root file system, we can either extract the root fs.tadgz to the root partition, or we can also use this rootfs.x4, which is an uncompressed x4 file system image, and we can use the dd command to copy the contents to the root partition. So what I could do in the folder where my boot images are and my root file system x4, right click, open in terminal, then I can simply use the dd command with my input as rootfs.x4 image, and I would like to place that on my second partition of the SD card, which was SDC2 under dev. So this might take a tiny bit of time, but here we go. Now this command has completed and we've copied the uncompressed X4 image over to our root file system. Now looking at our SD card on our boot partition, we have these three files we just simply copied over and then we have our root file system where we've extracted or moved over the image that was generated by a Peta Linux build. So now we can unmount the SD card and then plug that into our custom hardware, the SD card holder. With our SD card now partitioned and written to as required, all we would have to do now on our hardware is simply take that SD card, plug it into our micro SD card holder, set the relevant boot mode pins. And remember the boot mode for SD card boot is boot mode zero is one, boot mode one is zero, and boot mode two is one. And I can set that with these dip switches. Then all you have to do is set those boot modes, power up your device, open a terminal on your host machine via USB, and you'd see Peta Linux boot. Now, an extra step I'd like to show you because I don't have my SD card actually hooked up to MIO40 to MIO45, but to other pins, I'd like to show you a little trick that you can use to also then boot from the SD card, even if the pins aren't mapped to how they should be, for example, given in the user guide. The way we're actually going to do that is by generating a first stage bootloader, and then we actually boot from QSPY memory, which is attached to the zinc. The first stage bootloader, which is then triggered on the QSPI, will then jump to the SD card. This is pretty neat because the QSPI first stage bootloader contains information that we set in Vivado about the specific pinouts for our particular hardware design. So it'll jump to wherever the SD card is connected to. And this we can also use if we would like to boot, for example, from eMMC memory, which I also have on this design. Design. So this can be useful in many cases if you want to boot from SD cards which aren't mapped to the standard pins, so to speak, or if you'd like to boot from EMMC. 
So what we want to do is generate a first aid bootloader. Then we want to boot using the boot mode to select pins from the QSPY and the QSPY first aid bootloader will then jump to SD card or EMMC depending on your needs. The way we do that in Vivado, again, assuming you've exported the hardware, our XSA file, let's go to tools, launch Vitis IDE, and we'll use the Vitis IDE to generate our first stage bootloader. I actually already have a project here, but just to show you the workflow, we will go to file in Vitis, new application project, then we'll choose create a new platform from hardware XSA, and I would then simply navigate to the XSA file I exported, for example. Then you can give this a simple project name, leave everything else as default, leave this page as default. And what I'd like to select is the Zinc first stage bootloader project, click finish, and that will then generate that project. I happen to have done exactly the same thing. And then in main.c in the explorer on the left hand side under source, find main.c. If we scroll down a bit in the source code for this first stage bootloader, under line 360, we can see the first stage bootloader actually reads the boot mode register. And this is dependent on our strapping pins for the boot mode. So the way we can then ignore those boot mode pins and simply jump to the SD card or EMMC straight away is comment out those lines, then select the boot mode register to always be the SD mode or EMMC mode, depending on your requirements. And this is what I've done. So I've simply commented out these two lines and popped in boot mode register is SD mode. So the process is then is we set our boot mode pins to QSPY. The QSPY is read with the first stage bootloader and that simply then always jumps to the SD mode, which depends on our XSA file, which we loaded in here anyway. So that can jump to a different SDO. All we have to do is then click build. So what we then have to do with this build is take this first stage bootloader, create a bootable image, and then flash that to the QSPY memory of our device. So after building the project, let's generate the boot.bin. And again, this will be put on the QSPY flash memory. So we go to Xilinx at the top, create boot image, zinc and zinc ultra scale. We'll select import from existing BIF file, browse, then under your workspace and your project name, go to export, to your project name again, software, your project name again, boot, and there is the BIF file, which we need. If we open that, the output format needs to be binary and the output path select wherever is convenient for you. But you can see this is the output path where our boot.bin, our boot binary will be generated. In terms of boot image partitions, you might have three here. What we actually only need is a bootloader as well as the bitstream if you happen to have a bitstream as well but you can pretty much ignore that. So pretty much we just need the bootloader and this is taken from your workspace, from your project, dash FSBL, debug, and the L file that was generated on build. So that's the file you need to add as the bootloader. With all of that in place, all you have to do is then click create image and that will create our boot.bin. With the boot image created, what we have to do is connect up our board so we can program the QSPY memory. For this, you have to put your device into JTAG boot mode. So I'll select all of my switches to be low. So I have 0, 0, 0 on boot mode 0, 1, and 2. So now if I plug in my device with the FTDI connector via USB, so I'm doing it this right now, then in Vitis, I'll go to Xilinx, program flash. I'll auto detect the device as the image file will use our just generated boot.bin. My flash type for this particular board is QSPY, single and the init file is in the same folder as the boot.bin and that's the fsbl.elf. Then we can click program with our device connected and of course set to JTAG boot mode before power up. I click program. This might take a little while to program the flash. And there we go. The flash operation was successful. It did take a couple seconds, nearly a minute to complete, but this has now programmed our first stage bootloader to the QSPY memory. And this first stage bootloader will then jump to SD card boot. So we'll have to set our boot mode in this case, in this workaround case to QSPY boot. The QSPY then has the boot binary first stage bootloader, which will then jump to SD card boot, which then we can use to boot Peta Linux. So here with our board and we have our partitioned and flashed SD card. So what I'd like to do is turn this around. I'll put the SD card in the SD card holder. Then we have to select the right boot mode. So if you have the SD card hooked up, for example, to the default MIO pins, you would just have to select the boot mode to be SD card boot. And SD card boot is simply 101, so boot mode 0, 1, and 2. In my case, I have the SD card actually hooked up to a different SDO. So that's why we're doing this QSPY boot workaround. And that's why for this case, if you're using different SD card pins or if you're using EMMC memory and you're using this first stage bootloader, of course you want to boot from QSPY memory first. So that's why my boot node needs to be one, zero, zero to start the first stage bootloader, which we programmed to the QSPY flash, which then jumps 
to the SDO interface defined by our XSA file. So that's why here might be a bit hard to see, but I've actually selected 100 as my boot mode, which is QSPY boot, which then pulls the image of the QSPY flash and jumps to the SD card once it's reached that point in the first stage bootloader. The XSA file, of course, defined also all of the other peripherals, including the USB to UART interface, Gigabit Ethernet, and so on. So with any luck, this now, when we plug it in, should boot Peta Linux. So what I'll do, I'll just prepare a serial session here. My port happens to come up as COM15, and the default board rate we set was at 115200. If I plug in my power, you can see the done LED is on. I'll just open my serial port and we can see our kernel is now booting, Petalinux is booting. And there we go, I've enabled auto login, so therefore we are now in Petalinux and you can see this was actually quite a quick boot, definitely in comparison to the JTAG boot, and we can use this workaround using the QSPY flash in a first stage bootloader in case we want to use the EMMC memory or we have the SD card mapped to different pins. Remember again, if we have the SD card mapped between SDO, MIO pins 40 to 45, we simply all we have to do is use the SD card boot. We don't have to do this FSBL first stage bootloader workaround. So in Peta Linux, this is now running off the SD card using DDR3 memory, all of the various peripherals. And if we, for example, list the root file system contents, this is exactly what we had in the SD card under the root file system, the root partition. We'll be using Petal Linux in future videos, showing you how to use Gigabit Ethernet, various tools, and also how to go into more depth into Petal Linux, and actually doing something, so to speak, interesting with this device after we've now gone through all of the setup. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful, and I hope it showed you how you can boot Petal Linux from an SD card. If you liked the video, please leave a like, a comment if you have any questions, and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with any latest PCB design, hardware design, DSP, and embedded systems videos. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.